Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. Uh, this is Steve Spector, your host. With me today is Rob Hirsch- Hirschfeld. Good afternoon, Rob. Hello, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to pause my, my frantic GitHub backups for a second and uh, do a podcast. Let me introduce Rich before we get going. So Rich, Rich Miller, the CEO and Managing Director at Telematica is with us. Rich, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Nice to hear both of your voices. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. So, Rich, uh, quickly, I know it's hard, but let's uh, do a quick overview, a little bit about yourself, and then uh, we'll jump in. There's lots of topics, but this Git thing is quite interesting as well. The short story is about a third of my career as a hardcore technologist designing and implementing upper layer protocols at a time when people were still arguing about OSI and um, TCP IP and the various suites and the approaches going that way. And the remaining two thirds of my career have been focused on, I would say, product strategy and, and early stage company strategy. And I am a um, serial offender here in Silicon Valley, having been involved with a lot of early stage companies, sometimes as a founder sometimes as a consultant, often as an advisor and board member. Um, My interests of late, and of late, I guess now spans close to 15 years, is um, high performance computing and grid, both data grid and compute grid, all of which has kind of morphed into what we now think of as cloud, cloud computing, And um, I have um, found myself as well truly taken by the abilities that we now have available to us with respect to data. So everything from the care and feeding of data to the, you know, the latest in analytics and insight and machine learning. Um, And the companies that I involve myself with often have to do with the topic that I usually think of as data husbandry, the care and feeding of the data set rather than the analytic portion. I've also been a long time advocate of, and and it's been uh, one of my soapboxes, uh, which is edge computing and its relationship with not just IoT, but a variety of other uh, types of Uh, industrial and enterprise computing. And of course, I can't, you know, hold my head up in any game of buzzword bingo without saying distributed ledger blockchain has been a very big part of my focus over the course of the last, I would say, four years. Um, Consultancy, for the most part, to early stage companies and a few large companies with whom I spend reasonable amount of time as a product strategist and, and I would say gadfly. <laughs> that's, as, that's about as short as I'm gonna make it. <laughs> I, and, and Rich and I have had, I've had the privilege to be in a lot of long technology conversations with Rich where we, we plumb the depths of not just one of these topics but how they connect together and so um, Rich, you, you're involved with uh, the Blockchain Technology Partners team, who we did another podcast with, so I'd, I'd highly recommend uh, people listen to that. Also, if they want to hear some blockchain, and, and hopefully you and I, when we talk, when we get to blockchain, which we'll probably do later in the, in the second half, um, that would be a good primer for people. Um, we have a whole bunch of other fun topics to cover first. Okay. <laughs> Um, the, the first one, so, so we're recording this on the, on the day after the GitHub announcement with Microsoft taking over GitHub. Um, I, I'm not so worried about the, the good or bad, although you can, you know, you can give me the summary there. I'm, I'm more interested in the, how GitHub became such an important thing. What, what does it represent in market that it's got people so excited or anxious? Excited or anxious, and anxious because it might change. Is that your implication? Uh, you know, I I think that there's a couple ways 
that, that people look at anxious. They look at losing uh, control of the IP. They look at, you know, the, the, it, the, let me back up. So, so what, what, why do you think GitHub is so important to people? It has been such a, a major revelation to have provenance of code. It has been that uh, simplification, if you'll pardon the, the use of the term, uh, but it's been a simplification and a, um, a, you know, a good friend to almost any and every developer and increasingly just anybody that's managing written content um, as a way of keeping track of the provenance and the lineage of their work the ability to backtrack, take an, I mean, this ability to backtrack, this ability to take another path, to split things off and then rejoin the, this notion of rejoining the trunk. It has such a, um, a liberating, it, it really is a liberating kind of technology that people can use either very, in a very sophisticated manner or just you know, in a in a workmanlike manner, and still gain incredible benefit, and it's it's capable of being there and for you know, kind of available to us at at all times. It it has, it, as I was saying to you earlier, it, it, I'm surprised somebody hasn't uh, already suggested that it be incorporated into the Bill of Rights. Every developer should have access to GitHub. I, there is there is no doubt that when GitHub is down, significant parts of the internet are down. The thing I'm I'm impressed and and surprised at is when you're talking about GitHub, what you're describing to me is, is more Microsoft productivity components, right? Uh, documents, uh, you know, the lineage of documents, uh, information that's being stored. I think of LinkedIn and I think of, you know, resumes and, and people. Right. And there's, there's all this information that's besides just storing code and making, you know, license code available to people and being a, you know, sort of a distributed database that Microsoft should be totally um, the best steward for, in, in, in some ways more so than, than GitHub has been a steward for it. Um, maybe that's part of this divide. People see you know, this very rich data that Microsoft is very good at, 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 at dealing with, as and opposed to some of us look at it as a code, or it's just, you know, oh yeah, it's a bunch of code, we don't want Microsoft to, to control that. Yeah, I think that your, your point is extremely well taken. That's where Microsoft could build on this, and if they can prevent themselves or restrain themselves from being, you know, kind of turning it into Excel uh, with, you know, a, another 3,000 specialty pieces of, of um, commands and, and switches and, and variations and truly point it at the, it, its objective, which is the, the maintenance, the provenance, the lineage of content then they could take this, um, a, you know, really quite, quite far. And just to that point, when I say content, you know, content doesn't have to be a big document or um, even that much of a, of a snippet of code. We, we can talk about um, lineage and provenance of a, an item or a datum that's, you know, a few bytes long. It could be a record in a database or what we used to think of as being a record in a database. So there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of headroom here left for, um, for GitHub and for its technology. And I think it's now a matter of, you know, how creative a number of people can be. To Stephen's point, I think a little bit, you know, the anxiety may be one of, oh no, somebody's going to come in and they're going to spoil it. They're going to ruin it for all of us because they're going to find out it's good for something else and we'll be invaded. We'll have the carpetbaggers show up and they will make a mess of it and it will be 
um, it won't be our territory anymore. So yeah, I can see why it's that. So I, I want to I want to try and stretch that thread into the open source component for the thread because right people when they think of Microsoft, especially the pre Nadalia Microsoft, they think of you know take take the money first and run. Sorry about the noise. They think of take the money first and run. Um, you know, sorry, Microsoft, but that you, know, you, you, you got, you, you got the reputation of proprietary, proprietary, proprietary. And uh, GitHub is, is the opposite of that. Um, yeah. how, how do we, you know, when we look at this open source ecosystem that's been building, GitHub is like the center, center of that. Um, instead of talking about GitHub, where, how, does, how has open source been evolving in your, in your perspective? And, and where is it, is there, are we on a precipice or are we moving mm. to a new era? That's a good question. Well, are you, are you asking about the, the evolution of open source as a, um, as, a de, as a model for development and sharing? Are we talking about it as the, underpinning for for operations which you know can be um mm -hmm. always visible and you know for which we have to make allowances for changes but at the same time have a lot of good support in that or are we talking about the commercial aspects of of open source which you know all i have to do is say commercial and open source in the same sentence and and <laughs> somebody's gonna you know have you know, high blood pressure as a result. I, I, without a doubt, and we, we see that, I, I guess I see open source and people love to throw the word free in the middle of this and <laughs> thus commercial, it becomes this antonym, but yet, you know, the projects that, that we love to talk about, you know, OpenStack and Kubernetes, um, you know, our own stuff with Digital Rebar, they're, they're, they, they have to have, you know, some, financial support within them, they have to have an ecosystem, they have to drive that. Right. GitHub has sort of been this, this home of dump your project here and, and we'll you know, give you a project page and, and do all these things. Um, that, that era seems to be challenged to me. It does, and at the same time, I would also lay claim to the idea that um, without knowing about it or without identifying it as such. The open source movement has been closer to um, a belief in kind of the, the collective commons, the, the notion of a, of, a, of a set of resources that benefit everyone. It doesn't mean that everything is you know, socialized or uh, communal. It simply means there are a few things and these things change over time which are naturally um, best provided as, you know, for the benefit of the common wheel, as we, thought, as we think of it. And in that sense, um, you know, the, this, is, this is maybe the antithesis of the, of the uh, people that talk about the, the tragedy of the commons, I would say, this is the this is the victory of the commons. I think that's where open source actually, can, you know, has brought us, and I think that's where it continues to live. You're right. I mean, we do have to continue to support it, and and commercial enterprise has to support it. But um, there's a recognition of what it does for us all. Well, the, one of the things that's interesting, right? Git as a as a as a Git, not GitHub, but Git itself is, mm -hmm. you know, software that is, that is, that is open, that is, it doesn't have a right. you know, sort of a corporate champion. GitHub was, was famously not making a lot of money, was not that much of a, um, now they, they did very well in the, in the stock swap, but it wasn't a commercial success. Um, it never has been. But it, it strikes me as this mantra of if you want to monetize open source software, do it as a service. So, right, and GitHub yes. just, just sort of reinforced that point. It's like, all right, we're going to take Git. Nobody's making money from Git. Um, if, if, you, if you believe otherwise, if you're a listener, 
tell us in the show. <laughs> we're, we're happy, happy to, to talk about it. It's this essential technology. GitHub as a service is essential technology now. Um, there's, but nobody's right, writing open source platforms and then and finding a way to monetize them, unless I'm wrong, without being a service. I think that's true. I think the, the great majority of what we'll see in the, in the near future, and at least for the foreseeable future, is going to be exactly that. To the degree that um, people focus on open source, the, the monetization, the commercial support will be its delivery as a service or as services. And um, that is, I think that's, that's inexorable. I mean, it, it may be, it may feel like it's slow moving, but if one, you know, takes a step back and looks at the situation we encountered 10 or 15 years ago with open source, where the idea of building commercial software, commercial offerings, and particularly service offerings on the back of open source, even if it was commercially supported, was looked upon as very risky and something you just weren't about to do. And then you had companies that were building, for example, retail um, stock trading platforms and services built completely on open source commercially supported, commercially programmed, but it was all open source. And they brought these systems in very, very high quality, uh, blew away a lot of the incumbents, and they brought them in at uh, costs that were a fraction of what had been uh, the case uh, with the first internet um, versions of these services. How do you argue with that? I don't think you can. I, I don't think you can either. And with, however, it, it feels to me that the market has taken a dramatic shift um, towards the as a service offering for it, right? Mm -hmm. if, if, I'm, if I'm building an as a service offering and everything is open, it's you know, effectively a black box. I've gotten the benefit of a software stack that I, I got with minimal cost mm -hmm. uh, because of because of shared commons and now I'm off monetizing right people would com complained about uh, Amazon quite a bit for this right a lot of their services are built on open source technologies that they they use and they don't there's there's no either they, there isn't or they don't funnel you know profits from those services back to the uh, the authors well uh, I guess there's, there's no way a question. to I mean, Rob, if, if we actually did a survey and did a census and you asked, you know, how many of the authors of the dominant pieces of open source code draw down a salary from someone uh, who's supporting their work in this, um, how much of it is truly voluntary and, you know, for the, you know, the bed, you know, the, the common good, um, on an individual basis, I bet you'd find that the, the great majority at this point of high use open source software is being supported by, you know, somebody, somebody commercializing it somewhere. Um, there's, uh, to your point, there is a lot of, there continues to be a lot of volunteer open source, um, truly philanthropic. But those, I think in terms of the real impact of, you know, of what we're seeing show up in the market, I find them to be less present and more um, the kinds of things that, for example, Google has done, which has taken their in-house, quite purpose-built technologies and decided what the world needs is an open source version of them. And they have actively gone out and promoted it, 
made the right thing, quote, the right things happen, such that you know, we have um, things like Kubernetes, but we also have uh, Apache Beam. We have a number of, of areas in which companies have thrown their efforts into the creation of open source versions that um, bring the the use the the using public to around to a, a you know the right way of thinking about these kinds of technologies and if Google or GCP you know makes um, money as a, as a result I would also say that you know Amazon Azure <laughs> Alibaba Tencent are also you know doing exactly the same so right you know. <laughs> Is it a um, is it a virtuous circle? Maybe, but it certainly seems to be working, and it certainly works a lot better, and is more in line with what we see today. That we can build on in terms of the technology available to us, because I can't see any other way of getting to these kinds of this kind of functionality with that, with this kind of speed. I mean, that's is, this so, is amazing. Yeah, I agree with you. And this is, this is the interesting dilemma as I watch something like Kubernetes. And I was actually thinking even Golang, yeah. um, you know, and, and there's a lot of open source technologies. And the, to me that we we're, we're emerging classes of open source technologies. Um, like a language is, is in a different class than Kubernetes, mm -hmm. which is an operational platform. Right. Um, you know, platforms are, you know, well, they're both very dynamic, but they have different characteristics, just like an operating system is different. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's no sort of simple, like, you know, universal open, open source thing. Um, and because different, different term? tiers, different, well, different tiers, have <laughs> open source tiers. I, I don't know. Um, but at, at the same time, it, there's a, there's something that troubles me in what you say, mm -hmm. because the, the investment required, for, for, for so let's, let's rewind you know, to the way, way back machine, go back a whole year mm -hmm. <laughs> and talk about pre-Kubernetes pre uh, dominance. Right. Um, there, there were a whole bunch of companies who had been investing in uh, container schedulers. Uh, I can think of four, maybe five, yeah. six, right off, right, off right, Docker, sure. uh, Mesos, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Helm uh, Deus, right. um, Rancher, uh, right. Kubernetes, of course, you had, I think, uh, oh, oh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's, that's just the top, Rob, top of the list, you know, not enough coffee this afternoon. Um, but uh, I know there are more. Uh, wow. I mean, one one, you know, that, that landscape altered dramatically. Is it because of Google's deep, do Google and Red Hat, their deep right. pockets? Um, is that, is, are we do only they, get... Well, do you, do you really think they bought their way into this? Or did they, you know, were they smart in their use of their, of their funds that, uh, such that w the way in which they made it happen, um, you know, was, in line with also the demands they were reading they were reading the demand for um container orchestration container management and uh they were they were dead on in the way they read it i, I I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna take a super cynical okay um, position here for fun yes. <laughs> i don't um because it'll be more entertaining the people that were displaced, the companies that were displaced, were had were trying to deliver software mm -hmm. with more of a profit motive uh -huh. than Google, who maybe you know I, I I don't think we entirely know what their financial incentives are, and I always believe that you know open source has financial incentives, and people you know I think it's 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 a, it's challenging to take open source and assume that it's it's happening because of of goodwill. There's, there is financial incentive. Absolutely. Um, and, and so uh, Google, 
it, here's the question. Yeah. What's their, what's, what is the perspective? What's the, what's the timeline on which uh, companies like Google or Microsoft for that matter, you know, what's the timeline on which they operate? When you're talking about early stage companies or, you know, Silicon Valley uh, startups, you know, the ranchers, for example, you know, what a great team, what a great, great group of people and what a good idea. But, um, you know, we are now at a point where um, their, their objective, their, their, their objective after once getting into the market and, and getting momentum is um, how fast can I monetize this? How fast can I be a stalwart in the, in the industry? And um, on what basis will I, you know, get an exit? You know, these companies, you know, the, it's, it's more and more rare that these companies will, will show up as IPOs. They will be acquired. And if, if we're talking about the, the timeline or the perspective, you know, Google has a, has a different line of sight on this and what their objectives are, what Microsoft's objectives are in, in pushing open source or these aspects of open source is going to be quite a bit different from what the, you know, the early stage technology company is going to be. Right. And, oh, and, and, I, and I think what you just described is part of what we saw happen with Docker, um, where absolutely. they had this great technology and then they couldn't figure out which parts they needed to monetize to make their investors happy. Um, exactly. And, and, and not only could they not decide, system. they kept kind of, it's, it felt like they were, you know, there was a flavor of the month. You know, it was like, we're going to do it. No, maybe we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it this way. And at a certain point in time, I think um, they lost, they have lost, uh, you know, a, a significant amount of momentum and certainly their, their dominance in this whole notion, this whole area has, has certainly changed. Um, but so does, does that, does that then mean that platforms like this because I, I do think there's you could have a much smaller scope open source thing that's interesting and we see those mm -hmm. dropping into cncf all the time mm -hmm. but these these bigger platforms end up having to have the deep pockets longer perspective of, of big companies to make it happen is that sort of what what the ecosystem looks like um yes it is what it's looking like and and i'd even go so far as to say it's going to be it, it, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, the whole way in which technology companies are going to be um, identified, embraced, and enshrined as the uh, the basis on which uh, the technologies will be built is changing massively right now as a result of the you know the super investor. You know you've got a you know, a soft bank with not just one, but two uh, hundred billion dollar funds that's willing to pick the winner and say, you know what, um, your technology is the technology we choose. We're going to offer you a, um, a really lovely exit. You're going to be rewarded handily. And if you're not comfortable with that, we'll crush you. We will find something else. We will find someone else right. and we will, we will roll right over you. So it's a, wow. it's a very, it's a very unusual situation for early stage. And I will say early, I don't mean, you know, five guys, 10 guys in a garage. I'm talking about, you know, uh, companies with a couple hundred people, uh, a good line on what they're doing. And um, I, I, I am both in awe and in, in some sort of mortal fear as to what, what that whole 
um, uh, situation is going to do to um, technology uh, as we look at it over the course of the next few years. So, so that is a perfect tee up to one of the conversations that we've been we've been having and playing with a bit, which is ISVs, independent software vendors. Mm. Uh, we had a we had a, a podcast with Chris Short um, came out June first, um, where you know we talked about Kubernetes and the evolution of Kubernetes, and at the end said there isn't an ecosystem of independent software vendors who are going to be enabled by Kubernetes. You just made it even bigger, where you're saying that independent technology vendors um, are going to have, you know, the current is, is really strong against them. Yeah. Ah, how, I mean, is, is this mean innovations only coming from big companies? What, where is our in, in independent software vendor, in, independent technology vendor going to be? Well, you know, having been around long enough to see the you know, the pendulum swing, you know, back and forth, and you know, the things tend to run in cycles. Um, I would say we're we're going into a, a period of you know the big company consolidation, and it is going to be the it's going to be big money and big services that you know uh, kind of call the tune for a while. Um, at the same time. Um, there are areas of the technology ecosystem where if a company comes to me and says, um, I'm interested in uh, designing a new switch fabric for, you know, and I'm sitting there going, no, I'm not touching it. Um, there is, there's, there's very little in the way of uh, possibility that you're going to win on this, even if you've got a, a, a great technology. Um, so is, is that, is that because that you're basically saying these huge, that the cost of being absorbed and, and put into the, into this process is so high mm -hmm. that there, that, that the crossing, so, so the crossing the chasm cost is Green so room. enormous. Is what and, you're and I, I, and I would couple that with the fact that the big companies, the Googles, the Amazons, and the Microsofts, quite frankly, are doing all three, and those three in particular, are doing a bloody phenomenal job of delivering to the market what the developer community wants and needs mm -hmm. and the services that they're using to build some completely awesome web scale offerings and but, when you when you look at that and you kind of say all right um these are not the big old clumsy slow you know you know behemoths that we came to to believe as as um you know the ones that were in our way rather the guys that in in many cases are leading the charge I I think you know we're we're in a situation that as long as that as they can maintain that we're we're likely to see more of the same. But wait, but wait a second, and and maybe it's because there's three of them. I, I keep going back to to Microsoft in the '90s. Oh um, um, yeah, different company. Very, well, yeah, but 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 not the company so much as as the market. Right, Windows became this this addressable market for, for ISVs where you could write software mm -hmm. that had a hundred percent. And this is why they got sued and broken up, but basically a hundred percent of, of users could adopt your software because they, they made windows this big stable platform that you could be an ISV and sell software into. I could, I could sell, you know, a, a, a visual basic app, I did, a visual basic <laughs> application, right. and you could have a worldwide market for it um, and overnight. What would, what, would you, what would you build and sell today? You'd sell um, a specific kind of an offering that would be as a service, you know, running on an Amazon, Google, um, or maybe as part of, you know, force.com, maybe you'd find it, uh, best done with Alibaba, Tencent, 
Uh, you, not just, you just, not just, you just destroyed my Cam. I, if, if I have to write an <laughs> as a service and deal with five vendors with very different platforms, I, you know, maybe each one's maybe, you know, and selling into Amazon is obviously the choice because it's so much bigger. Um, and, not sure about know, that, but go ahead. Well, okay. And, and this is, this I think is where things get exciting potentially mm -hmm. is Google says, Hey, do it for us because we're going to make it easier, cheaper, better. Um, but is the competitive dynamic in this market make it so that the vendors themselves are like trying to introduce features so quickly to compete with each other that they're not leaving any oxygen for an ISV? Um, they're, not leaving as much as they used to, that's for darn sure. Um, at the same time, the, the demands of an industry that has yet to be served, because remember, we're, we're still at a point in time with, uh, a matter of fact, I, I don't, it may have been in one of your fairly recent podcasts, somebody made the claim or made the statement that um, uh, enterprise software is is about at the 10 somewhere between 10 and 15 percent um cloudified or or you know kind of transition to some Ar Ar Artila, yeah yeah so there's this humongous um pent-up demand and interest in moving to um you know the next world come into the 21st century but it takes a longer period of time, and these are companies which are in businesses other than technology in, in many cases, and they, uh, at least a few of the, of the gray hairs, have enough memory left and enough brain cells left that they remember, you know, when I get locked into a vendor, it's not a good thing. I need, in fact, um, multiple multiple places to go. I need multiple sources. And this is why you're starting to see a slightly different flavor of ISV or, or service um, company that is dedicated to the idea of let me make sure you are capable but also comfortable in utilizing um, both Amazon and um, Google and if need be and at, when it's appropriate, IBM or Oracle Cloud. Um, those, are, those are the kinds of companies, as a matter of fact, that are focusing on that aspect of, of our industry, which has been kind of, in my mind, bringing up a tail end, which is the data. You know, ah, right. that's, a, that's, a, that's a place where, you know, so, you and I could go on for a long time, but well, so so what what you just what you just opened up in this case is a lot of these companies from a data perspective and Internet of Things perspective, right? Jumping over cloud mm -hmm. into edge, mm -hmm. where where they're generating a lot of these companies is, is you know have are generating now data, edge data, distributed data. They have customers in the field. They're they're collecting data. At a how much place. does edge disrupt? This yep. this hierarchy we just we just spent thirty minutes defining. Great question, Rob. And I think therein is exactly kind of if you want to say that may be our salvation, or maybe that's the salvation for a continuing, a continuously innovative and dynamic industry. I think that that's a that's a good uh, that's a good springboard because so, edge. Ahead changes so much um, it it really is hard to take all the lessons learned from cloud infrastructures from from the the various wins that we've had from cloud and make them all work perfectly in edge computing and particularly with um, IOT, industrial IOT. Uh, just like when the web first started, nobody had a clue until it started to grow 
that there was a need for, a vital need for um, CDNs. And, you okay. know, we have, we will, you know, those are, uh, the, they are, <laughs> they are still very much with us. They are still, it's still a vibrant area. And there, yes, there are some leaders, but there are, you know, they're not going away. And there's still quite a lot of innovation being done in content delivery. And, you know, I've argued the point too often, probably, and, and made a joke of it, but um, industrial IoT is just CDN when you reverse the polarity. You know, we're, we're putting... So good, that's a, I like that. I like that way to define it, though. It's good. Yeah. I mean, you're taking compute, storage, datacom, and not delivering from the center out and doing so in an efficient, both cost efficient and time efficient manner, but actually the reverse. You're drawing in, you're onboarding data from the outside world, figuring out what you need to do with it at the edge, um, maybe in a, in a region of the edge, not just a single, single kind of data center or gateway, and then also making a decision as to what to backhaul, when, what to save, what to move around. And it's, a, it's incredibly fun. So to, to what extent do you see uh, in the edge, IT infrastructure at the edge, mm -hmm. being a multi-tenant cloud-like experience, right? Is, is this something that people can just say, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got a factory, I install my servers, I need to manage them as a, you know, as sort of a hands-off, low, low latency, zero touch mm. unit, or do you see that actually becoming, oh, I need to rent some capacity mm -hmm. in my local pop because I don't want to have any, any servers on the factory floor? Um, I actually see multi-tenancy and the, the establishment of a, um, kind of a new service infrastructure around IoT. And I, I think it's probably two years away. Um, and I would say that there are a couple of preconditions that have to be met before we can actually see it come to pass. And one of them, by the way, is <laughs> probably the, the, the polar opposite of hands-on Kubernetes, it's, in some sense, it's, a, it, it's, it's the serverless experience, but it's the serverless experience at the edge. You, you cannot, in my mind, take a bunch of folks who have been building um, cloud-native applications, you know, predicated on the kinds of APIs we now use, with the API management we now use, and the considerations for data and data, data residency, data sovereignty in some cases, and make them understand enough about the um, environment they encounter on the edge to do the same job. We've, we're, we're probably looking at the, the serverless, you know, kind of high level abstraction where you really don't care um, and to get there, I think we're still a couple of years away. I don't know of anybody that's got it knocked yet. So, so you're saying something that, that I, I strongly agree with. I, I want to make sure that, that we're aligned and spell mm -hmm. it out. Cloud development patterns will be the edge pattern. There, mm -hmm. there will not be two ways to build software depending on where you are. You're, you're going to see software pe software developed in a consistent way yep it just so and and, and i've heard people describe this uh beth cohen uh at openstack uh, is widely quoted as saying right you know there is no di difference between edge and cloud not meaning that it's all you know we're building many openstack clouds on the edge even if people are doing that it's more saying that i'm, I'm not going to have two different types of programs I think, that, I think I think that is fair to say, and let me let me change that slightly. And that is, 
for there to be successful edge computing, there cannot be and there should not be two classes of, of development and, and programs and um, thought processes that go into development. Unless and until you can build applications that um, utilize you know, the API structures and the management of those APIs, the way you do in a cloud native fashion today on, you know, on what we think of as the cloud, unless and until you can do that at the edge, um, it's going to be it's going to be extremely difficult to make progress in industrial IoT and edge computing. Right. When it does, and I'm sure there's a lot of there are a lot of people working on exactly those issues. That's when the dam breaks, and that's when a lot of interesting, innovative um, developers are going to show up to the party. And yes, you will have um, somebody that's purchased, um, that actually owns uh, gateways and, and sensor modules that are already embedded in uh, the local uh, Chili's restaurant and somebody else wants to develop something that you know, shows up on that same platform, multi-tenancy, no crosstalk, no, no interference, it becomes a source of, um, um, it becomes a, a, it becomes a service platform. And there and that, are some variations. Strikes, go ahead, sorry. There are some variations of, uh, in the underpinnings and those have to be addressed. But um, I'm convinced that, that, that when that happens, you've, you're seeing a, a huge, explosion in IoT, what we think of as IoT. So that strikes me as getting back to our ISV roots again, right? In that, like <laughs> when, when Apple, I mean, I, yeah. so here's, here's my thing, right? I love the idea that somebody could write a new application that Chili's wants to buy, right? And, and the other fern bars too. And, and it solves a specific problem for them, right? You know, it's, it's the Diet Coke versus Cherry Coke versus mm -hmm. Pepsi, um, you know, whatever, some, some, some point app. But, but now we've, we've got a platform that, that somebody can, can actually distribute to all these, all these places. Because right now it's so hard um, on-premises yeah. uh, or edge to deliver anything at scale that that becomes impossible, right? It's, it, I mean, that this is, this is when I think about the, the challenge for ISVs, it's, you know, all right, if I'm going to sell you something on premises or at the edge, even worse, I've got so much work to do that I just don't, I don't even enter the market, right? Um, you know, all my home devices go back to a data center. They don't, they don't talk, they don't share data <laughs> locally. You know, if, if my phone is controlling my thermostat, it's doing it through the cloud. Mm -hmm. Even though the even though there's a you know one hop um, you know connection that it could take, and um, at the same time you're seeing companies that are moving more and more to you know edge compute, especially analytics, the application even of ML at at the edge, mm -hmm. um, where you know the 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 constellation of uh, devices and sensors at each uh, intersection that manage the street lights, the stop lights, the pedestrian walk buttons and signage and everything else also needs to talk to the upstream and downstream um, partners, you know, a block away, two blocks away, four miles away in order to make good local decisions, get uh, themselves organized in order to, you know, basically do yield management on on a resource called the roadway. So right. here's a, here's a perfect example of places where it is not going to be backhauled. It's not going to show up in the data center. It's not exclusively. Let's put it that way. So so does this 
become one of the killer applications for distributed ledger, aka blockchain. From that, I mean, this is not yes. what you just described as a distributed yes. data problem with lo locality. I'm, and and I'll, I'm going to say it becomes uh, an exceptionally good place to be thinking about distributed ledger technologies. You know, so, I, I've got a I've got a bit of a problem with blockchain qua blockchain. It's like Okay, it's a it's a it's a brand. It's like calling a, every every tissue a, a Kleenex, but um, <laughs> okay. it's distributed ledger, and there there are variations on that theme. But yes, you're absolutely right, and it's a lot about by, by the way, it's what you're doing with and for the data you capture as quickly as you onboard it, and uh, thereafter how it is. Um, how it is fed and watered over the course of its lifetime. So, so I'm going to, a listener's going to, somebody somewhere should accuse me of leading the witness. And, and it's not true. You and I've had <laughs> hours of conversations about this topic. Yeah. And so that, that was, that was too much of a layup. So I want to, I want to back up and, and give you a harder question. So the, the question I'm thinking of goes like, goes like this. Mm -hmm. If distributed ledgers are going to be important at the edge, we have these huge behemoths who are running around setting standards, you know, delivering software platforms. What things are necessary to create some type of standard or platform? You know, what, what's, what has to happen for us to actually emerge these technologies together? And you wait until the end of the con uh, of the hour to talk about this. <laughs> I, I'm looking for you to synthesize down because I, I know this is oh. this is this is its own hour topic. But I, I also know you well enough to know right. You've you've been thinking through how how do we how does the market move here? What's the linchpin yeah. that's that's keeping these these things from coming together? And maybe you know I'll let I you out with a not yet. But well, it's what, it. I I don't think I have the complete story. But I think that the this will be one of those cases where um, more than just an, uh, the individual enterprise, but rather communities of communities of interest. Um, think of you know supply chains, um, logistics, and transportation. Um, the the petroleum and the petroleum industry, the chemical industry, pharmaceutical industries. These are the powerhouse industries that you know, drive the rest of the economy that isn't tech. And they have very, very serious demands placed on them to rid themselves of friction. They are going to be the folks who drive this as much as anything. And I will hearken back to days when dinosaurs roamed the earth and every email system and email service was self-contained and didn't talk to one another. And if you had any enterprise inter you know, interaction via email, you went through some of the most bizarre, you know, Rube Goldberg uh, approaches to interconnection and interoperation that you can possibly imagine. And what happened? What happened was, and this is early, this is like mid 80s, the electronics industry, the petroleum industry, the uh, insurance agencies, insurance industry, their professional associations with an enormous amount of clout, clout went to the giants of the day. These were all telcos, you know, MCI, GTE, AT&T, ITT, you name it, and said, if you do not figure out a reasonable way to communicate with one another, you lose our business. The flip side of that 
any of you guys who do figure out how to efficiently work with one another and exchange electronic mail in a functional manner, that's where we're going to go. And the early standardization, as well as some of the earliest regulation for privacy and, and the, the things that raise the consciousness of um, <laughs> the, the U.S. Congress to um, look at how to deal with electronic communication was done on the back of exactly these kinds of communities of interest. And I think what we're going to have is something similar here. So this to me is a huge takeaway because what, what you're describing here is the edge, the internet of things, blockchain, uh, sorry, not blockchain, but distributed ledger, uh, are about stuff, not ethereal technologies, but hard goods. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those are the people who know how to work together to resolve standards, to reduce friction, um, which is, I think, why you see distributed ledgers being used in inventories and shipping and banking and, and places like that. Absolutely. Um, where there's a ton of, of pressure to sit around a table and work out a standard. It's not like um, you know, a fight where it's just an API spec. This is real exactly. goods. It, it is real goods, it's real money, it's, and it's, it's real business. And in, in point of fact, I would I'd go so far as to say, without that kind of pressures, we'd probably be living in a, in a situation where you've got the, um, the compute giants, you know, continuing to battle one another for, um, for market share. They will still do that, but they can't do, they will not be allowed to do that on the basis of uh, isolating or kind of entrapping their customer base. And this is extremely important. And it's, these it, it well, let me let me put it to you this way rob the technology that the banking and insurance and the transportation and the logistics supply chain industries are using today for their their proofs of concept are blockchains that are quite frankly among the the slowest clunkiest pieces of distributed database technology I've ever seen in my life. I mean, we've seen nothing like that in, in decades. Their perform, the performance sucks. The cost is huge. Why would these companies be spending this kind of effort and making as much noise about it as they are were it not important? It is very important, and they are sending the signal. And I think it's an, it's an important one. So, Rich, this is Steve Spector again. I am the bad guy who comes in. And um, this has been amazing. Great conversation, Rob and Rich. I, I, would, I enjoyed it, and I know I'm going to listen to it five more times, getting it ready to go out. Uh, and for our listeners to let you know, we're actually going to push this out the same week we recorded it. I think the information on the GitHub uh, Microsoft stuff is timely. So this will be uh, our first real, basically real-time podcast. So thank you again, Rob and Rich, for uh, joining and uh, having this conversation. Uh, Rich, if anyone wants to track you, follow you, where should they go? Um, on Twitter, probably best, it's uh, RHM2K. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks to both of you. And uh, we look forward to talking to you uh, again soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rob. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all.